This is all that remains of the three-story house where nearly a hundred young West Indians were celebrating at an all-night birthday seen. party for two young Swamp friends. Coming from all underneath the door and everything. Jumping else. out the window, fire was blazing, screaming. Later and discovered it, that it, it wasn't it even kind of sweat. Was, was it got so hot in frightening. there. Frightening. The people's skin was actually peeling. Because there's a lot of dead people in there and they said they're badly burned. They're going to have to identify them. My name is Kwame Kweyama and I'm the host tonight for this, well, this wonderful event. And the reason I think it's wonderful is because it's about not letting history slip by. Marking this, this time in our history, marking this event that happened in 1981, not forgetting it. Making sure that some of the lessons from 81 is still alive in our minds. Um, so I'm overjoyed to just be party to what is a remembrance but what is also a, a celebration. My name is Alex Pascal. Um, Lewisham or New Cross is by no way strange to me because from the 1960s, you may say late 60s, I've been in all these areas when we were having race relations and educational pro problems. And now that I'm back here, it's good to remember places like the Lewisham Way Centre that I was part of helping to found. And the many people who are even passed on now um, who have helped to develop this area. And as I was coming, I thought of one African man that many people may not remember, Bob Ovedi. He was quite someone. And the community relations officers like Asquith Gibbs. And so it's a great time as we recall 30 years of what happened in this area. How the police brutalized young people in that time. You couldn't walk the streets. There were no jobs for the children. The cultural side of everything else was not there. It's a great time to reflect. Yeah, there just wasn't much black history around. There wasn't much in the, uh, in the newspapers. There wasn't much at schools. There wasn't much in the library. There wasn't much on film or documentary. Um, so, um, yeah, so I delved into it. And, uh, and, uh, New Cross Fire was a story which is fascinating to me, um, how it came about. Um. Well, I got a phone call from Rex um, not that long ago, just before Christmas, asking whether I'd help um, finish the lineup for the event and also just help push it, promote it, raise awareness of it. So my main role here has been just getting the word out there so as many people as possible know that we have this event taking place this evening, remembering the New Cross Fire 30 years on. Um, I think it's important to remember all this black British history in general. And I think uh, um, the new, what's unique about you know, the New Cross Fire is that it was the start of, uh, of, of or it's a, some, it was the start of black British politics. It was something that was like a line in the sand, that after it, nothing would ever be the same again. And um, if young people, um, younger than me, um, if they can um, learn much more about the history, um, then maybe there'll, there'll be a greater sense of belonging a history that 30 years forward almost two generations might not have heard about it and I think I have to right here and now applaud the organizers for seeing the right to bring this again back into history there are so many phases to it I came in particularly because at that period I was the producer presenter for the Black BBC Radio London, Black Londoners radio program, which was the only program around co covering black affairs. And I lived from moment one when the call came to me of this fire. I say it's a fire of the t torching of black people in this area. Um, I came down, interviewed Mr. Rudder, and then became the chairman for the organizing body to raise money through Radio London, prisoners and everybody else, we raised 21,000 pounds to give and assist many things that was happening. The political side of it is deep. I think it's great now to ask Mrs. Satcher, and I hope one day she'll be alive to answer that, how she feels. But maybe she has no feeling. Maybe there are others, even senior to her, who never responded to it. What a time it was for black people. High commissions who were distant from their own communities 
came. The young and the old, the mothers and the fathers who could not see eye to eye all came back together. So let us look at it as another bridge, a bridge of sadness, but a bridge that has brought people together. And to remember the deviousness of politics, how the police tried to frame people who were innocent and around it instead of looking for the criminals. And up to today, we have not found 13 dead, nothing said. The reason I think that it was important to put this on is that 30 years ago was probably one of the first times where our parents' generation really came together as a people in the UK and stood up to be counted. You know, it, we were fed up of the way that we'd been treated in terms of just not had, having the level of recognition and also not having the same level of value placed on us as a people. You know, when 13 people die in a house fire, you don't just carry on as though nothing's happened. Um, and I think it's just important for us to remember those, um, those victims that have passed on, but also remember the surviving victims. This is still a very real experience for a lot of people, um, as well as look at how we came together as a community and what's changed, if anything, over the last 30 years. But we can't forget this type of thing. It's our history. It's not just black history. It's British history. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to this, this wonderful commemoration of the new cross fire. Like all commemorations, actually, it is also a celebration. It is not just a time to be maudling and to be sad, but a time to celebrate and remember the lives lost and remember and commemorate and send healing to the family and survivors. Today is a day, this evening is a day, where we reclaim history. Never let it be forgotten. This event is, is part of a series, an ongoing series of events to commemorate and to celebrate. There is a blue plaque ceremony, an installation at 439 New Cross Road, Lewisham, on Tuesday at 2 p.m. And there's a memorial service to be held at St. Andrew's Church in Brockley on Sunday. I, well, we have a, a wonderful evening of spoken word, of, of discussion and remembrance, and of performance. So I hope that by the time we leave, our spirits will not only recall our ancestors, will not only celebrate them, but actually will leave strengthened. First of all, we have with us Menelik Shabazz, uh, the filmmaker who made Blood Agaron. We have with us Professor Gus John. And we have with us Alex Pascal, OBE. Each one of the gentlemen sat here have played and did play and still continue to play a wonderful role, not only in our community, but in the events that unfolded in 1981. But I'm, I'm going to start, if I may, with um, Menelik and just to ask a few questions uh, about why you felt it necessary to, to make that film and looking at it now, um, how how it feels, actually. But before I go there, just to give you a little bit of housekeeping. Ladies and gentlemen, I know we're all very busy people. Um, could we switch our mobile phones onto silent, please? <coughs> just take this moment to do that. Thank you. And just to let you know that we'll probably be speaking for about 30 minutes here and then there may be one or two um, observations from the floor before we move to the second act where we'll have spoken word and as I've said, Janet Kay and Carol Thompson. So I'm gonna move straight to you if I may, Menelik. And again, and just say, what inspired you to make that film? Uh, what inspired me at the time was the, uh, uh, was the tragedy 
uh, what happened, and it struck all of us all over the country. Do you know what I mean? Like something just pow, straight into your heart and your soul. Um, and as a filmmaker at the time, I felt, um, well, I felt impelled to do something. And um, I was also part of the New Cross Massacre Action Committee. I represented an organization that I was with then, um, the BLF, the Black Liberation Front. And so I was part of the organizing element of the event uh, or the, um, the march. And so uh, I just felt I had to do something. And the film was really like a newsreel. That was the, the whole feeling of it. Um, the newsreel is like when um, uh, events happen and you find a way of trying to get it out quickly um, in a very short form. And so that format of a newsreel was really what I was thinking about. Were you, were you, were you funded to, uh, to make this film? <laughs> no. No, no, no. In fact, um, I had to beg, steal, and borrow uh, film stock because this film was shot on film. It wasn't like now where you're shooting things on tape. And film stock is like three, four hundred pounds for ten minutes. And so I had to um, beg, borrow, and steal from um, camera people and stuff to get the film stock um, to, to, to shoot on that day. And so everybody that participated, we had two crews shooting on the day. Um, contributed their, their time. I mean, it looked like there was more than two crews. I mean, you were at New Cross, you were at Waterloo, you were where the police were running with horses, you were where the, I mean, it, it must have been a, a, a hell of a day. And I'm not even just talking about the emotions. I'm talking just about logistically trying to capture this moment in history. I mean, what was the imperative and what kept you going? I, really interesting hearing you use words in the commentary like capitalist. You must have known that the police at the time went, oh my God, he's, a, he's an insurgent. I mean, what, what, what was the imperative apart from just capturing history that, that kept you going through this process? The imperative was to make this moment an important moment for us to remember and to capture it. That's really the imperative, you know, the moment, um, because it's now, 30 years later, it's hard to, so some people to actually know the impact, the imprint that that moment had on us. And so it was coming from that, um, you know, why I did it. And, um, and that put, propelled me forward, just to be able to say, we stand up for, um, um, for justice, but also that as a community, we will act and take uh, matters into our hands when necessary and make sure that we capture it because I knew that the media is going to try and change it, which they did. Because uh, what happened is, and you hear a lot of this kettering and all of that. Kettering, is that what they call it? Yes. Kettling, sorry. That's, if you look at what happened there, it's the same thing that happened then. At Blackfriars Bridge, they locked the people or barricaded them in a position where they couldn't move. All the press cameramen were waiting at Blackfriars Bridge. Um, and so you knew next day, I mean, I knew from my experience of media how they would cover a march like that. Any march that represents us is not going to be covered. So I had to take a stand, and that's how I looked at it, and that was my imperative, really. W wasn't there a, yes, indeed. No, no, we'll give the respect, yes. I think it was Zena Edwards, a poet, that reminded me that uh, there was a, a headline on the next day that said, black mob on a black day. I mean, so you're, you're absolutely right. My, my final question before I move on is, is looking at it now, 30 years on, I mean, I saw lots of faces of actors and of writers who now only look five years older, of course. <laughs> um, a, a real sense of activism seemed to be happening. How do you feel looking at it 30 years on? Wow. Um, looking at it now, as a filmmaker, I look at the things that I could do better. And you look at the things that 